Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh and welcome to an all new pair of Ace in the Day gameplays for the Arcade Mode of War Thunder. In today's episode I shall be reviewing the PE3 Early, a tier 2 battle rated 2.0 Soviet Heavy Fighter. As always, starting with the plane's history, we begin thus. At the initiation of Operation Barbarossa on the 22nd of June 1941, the Soviet Air Force did not field a dedicated night fighter as up to this point there had been no requirement for one. This was all to change following the first night bombing of Moscow by the Luftwaffe on the 21st of July 1941. The State Commissariat for Defence, the NKO, demanded a rapid response to this threat. This was to take the form of a night fighter which would meet the following requirements. Be heavily armed, have long flight endurance, and be based on an aircraft currently in production with the ability to convert this aircraft into a night fighter within four days. Pidlyakov's P-2 light bomber design was selected for conversion under the designation of PE-3, as it was the fastest twin engine aircraft in service of the Soviet Air Force at the time. The initial prototype was completed as per the requirement in under four days and made its inaugural flight on the 7th of August 1941. The changes made to the original PE-2 design as part of the conversion included the following. Firstly, the addition of three 700 litre fuel tanks, one in the fuselage bomb bay and two with the ventral gunner whip would have been based, extending the plane's operational range to 930 miles or 1,497 kilometres. The removal of the ventral gunner meant the plane's crew now consisted of two, the pilot and a rear gunner. Secondly, the bolstering of the original offensive armament of one 7.62mm Shukas machine gun and one 12.7mm Berezin UB machine gun with an additional 12.7mm Berezin machine gun, all these machine guns being based in the nose. Thirdly, the installation of a fixed 7.62mm Shukas defensive remote control machine gun in the tail cone to supplement the 7.62mm Shukas defensive machine gun as located in the dorsal position. Fourth, the removal of two of the fuselage bomb racks, reducing the plane's maximum bomb load from 1,600kg or 3,527 pounds to 700kg or 1,543 pounds. This being made up of two 250kg bombs being mounted on the remaining fuselage racks and one 100kg bomb being housed in each of the engine nacelles. Fifth and finally, the underwing dive brakes being removed to save mass. Over the course of its test program, the prototype was to prove adequate, reaching a top speed of 530 km an hour or 329 miles per hour at an altitude of 5,000 meters, 16,404 feet, and a service ceiling being obtained at 9,000 meters or 29,528 feet, thanks to the pair of Klimov M105R 1,100 horsepower liquid-cooled V12 engines retained directly from the PE2. Based on these results, factory number 39 in Moscow was ordered on the 14th of August 1941 to deliver five pre-production aircraft by the 25th of August. The pre-production aircraft were delivered on time and completed their test trials by the 7th of September 1941. However, due to the urgent need for the P3, factory number 39 was ordered to continue producing P3s whilst the test trials were ongoing. Excluding the prototype and pre-production aircraft, this led to 10 P3s being built by the end of August 1941 and rushed into service with the 95th High Speed Bomber Regiment who were based near Moscow. These 10 aircraft represent the earliest operational variant of the P3 and may be retrospectively designated as P3 early for our sake. To the Soviet Air Force, these aircraft were simply designated as P3s. Combat service was to quickly reveal several problems with the P3, including but not limited to the blinding of the pilot at night when either the nose machine guns were fired or a ground searchlight was pointed through the glazing of the lower nose, and that the lack of frontal armour for the cockpit made the crew vulnerable to defensive fire from the Luftwaffe's bombers. These problems were to be compounded by other problems identified during the test trials of the pre-production aircraft, including Firstly, the lower plexiglass nose windows cracking when the bottom 12.7mm Berez and UB machine gun was fired. Secondly, bullet casings and links ejected from the nose mounted 12.7mm Berez and UB machine guns entering the radiator intakes, causing severe damage to the plane's engines. And finally, the plane's offensive armament being considered as weak for the role it was meant to fulfil. I shall cover how these problems were rectified over the course of the successive production runs of the P3 in my historical overviews of both the P3 and the P3 bits represented in War Thunder. Yet until then, with our historical overview concluded, let us take a look at how the P3 early handles in the skies of War Thunder Arcade. 
For our first gameplay of today, we're on the ground strike map Stalingrad using the following setup. Air target belts are our offensive 12.7mm, the reason being in my experience, I found the air target belts deal great damage over time and have a high associated fire chance. But the same could be said of both the stealth belts and the tracer belts. The differentiating factor I found, and I cannot exactly explain why, is that I found the air target belts to be the most consistent at dealing damage over time compared to the other belts, which have been a bit more hit and miss. As for our offensive 7.62mm, we've taken the stealth belt here, we have three armor piercing incendiary rounds backed up by a single adjustment incendiary to act as a backup fire starter, and also a great damage dealer to those aircraft that lack any significant armor, i.e. the biplanes that you're going to be facing when you're the top battery rating aircraft as exhibited in this first gameplay. As for our defensive 7.62mm machine guns, we've taken the universal belts, which are able to deal great damage to a foe if they get too close on your tail, i.e. 500 meters or less, being able to shred their engine or at least set them on fire, meaning that you'll trade your aircraft with theirs mutually. Our gun convergence is set to 500 meters, as all of the offensive arms is based in the nose and therefore not convergence reliant. And as for our fuel load, we are taking a minimum load of 50 minutes to ensure we can make it to the end of the game, unscaled on fuel capacity. We begin our analysis by climbing towards the CR32 quarter, noting that as we climb towards them, the climb rate of the P3 early is average for its battery rating, and alongside that has mediocre sustainability. This means that other heavy fighters such as the Key 45 Co at your battery rating will be able to outclimb you in the long haul in a single climb, because the Key 45 Co, as an example, has the greater climb rate sustainability, meaning that at a climb angle of 25 degrees, they can continue to climb easily over successive web cycles, whereas the PE3 early after one or two of these cycles will need to start levelling out in order to build up its speed and go again. And this particularly becomes noticeable above 3,000 meters altitude, at which point the climb rate sustainability falls off, and you need to drop your climb angle to roughly 10 degrees to start building up your speed once more. But in turn, you have the ability to get to 3,000 meters altitude in these low altitude games in order to intercept the enemy bombers, such as the SB2M, and you can bring your firepower to bear and quickly dispatch them out of the sky. So it's not too much of an issue the climb, even in those higher battery rating games, you'll be able to get to an altitude sector where you'll be able to intercept those enemy bombers if you haven't got any assailants in the form of single engine monoplane fighters to block you. And this is a comforting factor, you can use this aircraft as a heavy fighter as designed. But as we note the lack of enemy aircraft up on high for the time being, or in their absence, we'll be looking towards boom and zoom tactics, because in such a game where you're the highest battery rating aircraft, most of the combat occurs below 1000 meters altitude, and there are going to be few opportunities up on high unless someone decides to take their monoplane fighter, such as a high ankle 100D1, up to high altitude to contest you and stay up on high to conduct boom and zoom. So once we dispatch this I-16 that's climbing up towards us, and here we can see how we decide to cut over the top, but we are held back a little bit by our lack of overall sustainability in the climb, making sure to cut them off in a head-on before they're able to get guns on us. We now cut through with a boom and zoom pass through the middle of the battlefield. And this is where the P3 early starts to exhibit some of its key qualities, particularly its ability to accelerate both in the straight and in the dive. Coming down on the P26B first, we note that the dive speed acceleration of this aircraft is rather nice, in that you'll experience a gradual fall off once you get to 600 km an hour plus. But with your maximum dive speed being 926 km an hour, which is very good for the battery rating, this makes this aircraft a rather hard one to catch in the dive, whether you're flying a monoplane fighter, or alternatively a biplane, more so the biplane. And as you break away, you can always switch over to the 7.62mm machine guns and try to encourage your foe to break off, simply because of the threat of the fast firing Chicasse machine gun. Then you can cut around via a loop here, and go again, getting up to altitude, what of your decent climb rate giving you that ability to quickly return to altitude, and then rinse and repeat to your heart's content, so long as nobody decides to stay right on your six and really get in the way. But even if they do, you can decide to break away towards friendly territory and use that great dive speed acceleration and ability to retain a good amount of speed in a straight line, which is rather average here at 490 km an hour, you can use that to keep yourself safe from any aggressors. Now the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of acceleration is in a straight line, and again the picture here is the same. You've got above average straight line acceleration. You can go from your stall speed of 140 km an hour up to 350 km an hour on engine power alone at a rather fast rate. And with all emergency power, this threshold goes up to 450 km an hour. Once you hit either of these thresholds, you'll find that the acceleration starts to drop off, but do not be surprised to be able to kick this plane above 500 km an hour in a straight line, and that is another comforting factor in the fact that you keep building up this speed to go at your targets. And you're going to need this speed because once you look at the concept of turn fighting, that's where the pretty picture really starts to fall apart. 
Now we have to assume because it's a heavy fighter, it's not going to be naturally as maneuverable as the majority of its single engine counterparts. But in the case of the PE3 early, it is the weakest of the turn fighting heavy fighters at its battle rating. And the vast majority of aircraft, if not all aircraft that it's going to face, will outturn it in the monoplane fighter, the biplane fighter, or the heavy fighter category. Even the likes of the VG33C1 at a battle rating of 2.3, and the Dornier 17Z7 with its rather interesting turn circle at a battle rating of 1.7. The issue with this aircraft is one of its control surfaces really compromises the other two, and that is the elevator. The elevator naturally for this plane is heavy, to the point where it will actually cause you to really fight against the aircraft in order to get the elevator to function properly. If you decide to conduct a loop, the loop circle is extremely wide, and you'll need to start your loop at 400km an hour, otherwise what you'll find is you're going to go into a stall mid-loop. As for the other control surfaces, your roll rate is average, it's nothing exceptional, but at the same time it's not atrocious for a heavy fighter of this size. And as for your rudder, it's rather poor, it has a great initial response, but it has a very wide flat rudder turn circle through sustained use. On the plus side however, the control surfaces are catered towards high speed boom and zoom attacks, in that your roll rate will drop between 500 and 700 km an hour by 50%. It is noticeable, but by the fact that the majority of your foes are going to be quite engrossed in engaging one another down low, but in these low battle rates and matches means that it's not going to be as difficult perhaps to follow a foe. Alternatively, you'll start to practice the concept of anticipating the movement of your position, which way are they going to cut next. Add to that the lack of a lock-up threshold on the rudder, it does not lock up at any speed in a high-speed dive. This means that you can maintain precise adjustments in boom and zoom attacks and follow your foe when they make the smallest of changes in direction and you can make sure that your machine guns are delivering on target. As your elevator, you'll find between 550 and 700 km an hour, there is no lock-up on the positive G response, which is great because it means you can pull out of a dive easily enough, or at least level out of it. The downside is you will lose 50% of your negative G response, so pushing the nose down. And that makes putting the nose down if you decide to come out of a dive, go into a zoom climb but then find someone hot on your heels, so you decide to push the nose down, this is going to take significantly longer than a typical aircraft around the battle rating, and this will bleed a lot of speed out of the aircraft and compromise your ability to escape. So you need to come to a decision when you're coming out of your boom and zoom dive in that are you going to fly straight away or are you going to fly back up and you'll need to be wary of those who could come onto your six otherwise you may find that your lack of negative g response is what is going to cost you your plane now the upshot of having an aggressor after you is this plane's airframe is rather durable versus the machine guns it's going to be seeing and even against the sporadic amount of 20 mm cannon fight it will see albeit as you go into those higher battle rating games seeing battle rating 2.7 and 3.0 position such as the Messerschmitt 109 ML4 those cannon will start to rip you apart but against the vast majority of planes what with their machine guns whether they be 12.7mm or 7.62mm in calibre you'll be able to take the fire quite well and on top of that, whilst the fuel tanks located towards the ventral gunner position of the PE-2 will be set on fire quite easily, they're not well protected, these fires will normally go out before the plane falls apart and you're not going to lose your plane to an excessive fire, meaning that you're still able to get back to base relatively unharmed. You may have taken some damage to the control surfaces around the tail section, but this plane is going to hold itself together and you shouldn't be afraid to take damage, something that other heavy fighters may be hesitant to do. With this game wrapping up, it's time to take a look at the post-game stats. By deploying our PE3 early in a variety of roles over the course of this game, particularly a dedicated heavy fighter for intercepting enemy aircraft up and high or conducting boom and zoom, and then a ground attacker raking the enemy ground vehicles down low, we're able to take out 9 air targets, 4 ground targets, and even pick up an assist, netting us 31,722 silver lines and 3,080 research points. And if anything else, this demonstrates the versatility of this aircraft at its battle rating, something perhaps not as easily found in the other heavy fighter aircraft available at 2.0. And because of this versatility, what you'll find is that this aircraft is going to cater to a number of different types of player. If you're looking for an aircraft which is a heavy fighter and you just want to go hunt down enemy bombers and harass fighters down low via boom and zoom, this aircraft is going to work rather well. Alternatively, if you want to go hunting ground targets and you want a decent amount of pace to be able to get in and get out of the fight, then the P3 early is going to work well, because the vast majority of the ground targets you're going to face will be lightly armoured to the point your machine guns can rip them apart, or alternatively you have multiple secondary armour options available to you, bombs of up to 700kg in total, or alternatively 6 rockets, the RS-132s. 
Now, of course, keep in mind that by going with the bombs and rockets, you will be weighing the aircraft down a little bit, and we'll come on to that in the second gameplay. But on top of that, that gives you the ability to take out clusters of ground targets more easily, rather than lawn mine with your machine guns. But as we now move on to our second gameplay, we're going to be seeing the P3 early in a game where we're having to use it against a batter rating 3.3 opposition at most, where I've had to force this player into a higher batter rating game to demonstrate both perspectives, only when it's top batter rating and when it's bottom batter rating, and we will be taking some secondary armament, but deploying it for a rather different purpose, which I quite enjoy in this plane. Let's move on. Our final gameplay for today takes place on the airfield domination map Kaminsk. For this we're using the same setup as before, but adding in the secondary weapon loadout of 4 100kg FAB100 bombs. I like to use these bombs whenever I'm in an airfield domination game, as this gives the P3 early the ability to become a nightmare to those aircraft that would try to capture an airfield, or have just captured an airfield and are getting ready to take off. You can use the graceful pace of this aircraft to swoop in, drop your bombs on the target, and break away to safety, as it left as a smouldering wreck on said airfield. Add to this the fact that there is a minimal impact to performance of this plane unless you take the maximum bomb load out of 700kg whereby you only notice a minor decrease in climb rate and that means that this plane is very comfortable to fly whether you enjoy flying a plane with secondary armament or not. It doesn't receive a considerable performance penalty unlike say the SPD-3 Dauntless or of the machine gun pods under the wings. And it's this comfort that gives additional versatility to the plane or encourages the versatility that we spoke about at the end of the first match. Unfortunately however, because this is a higher batter rating game, there will be a more considerable contest for the higher altitude region in the centre of the map, at least in the first quarter, meaning that we have to break away early, otherwise we'll be ripped apart most unlikely by the Spitfire climbing towards us. We were looking towards the XF5F, but the Spitfire would have got to us before we could have got to our destined target, meaning that we've had to make this breakaway and try to bait the Spitfire towards our friendly Messerschmitt 109 climbing above us right now. We have to keep in mind that if the Spitfire gets us in the turn fight, as echoed previously, we're really going to struggle with our extremely wide turn circle and heaviness on the elevator, and our control surface is not being too much up to scratch compared to the overall maneuverability of the Spitfire. And as we go to climb up towards them to try and get some shots, we take note of the fact the Hurricane is coming over towards us, and we decide to switch for the head to head. And here's perhaps where one of the downsides of the arm to this plane starts to show itself. You have only machine guns in the nose of the P3 early, whereas your batter rating contemporaries, the vast majority in terms of heavy fighters, will have a 20mm cannon of sorts in the nose. In the case of the POTUS 631, the French aircraft, it has two 20mm cannon, which can absolutely shred an enemy aircraft with accurate fire in a head to head, meaning that you lose out some of that damage potential in those head to head engagements at the longer distances out to 1.5km. That's not to say the machine guns you have available, but the two 12.7mm machine guns are terrible, and we can see the results building up right here against the TBF and the F222.2. But their damage is going to come through sustained damage over time, rather than just that initial strike, meaning that you are robbed of the ability in a good number of cases, particularly against planes with a little bit of armour and durability, to get that one shot kill, or that instant kill as you make your pass. Instead, you need a longer time on target to make the rounds count. And that can prove frustrating when you're in a dire situation where you literally only get that half a second on the target and you really need to make it count. But nonetheless, this is a point of quarrel which could be argued for or against. The machine guns giving you the ability to be more precise in your shots and not have to worry about exhausting your ammunition too quickly, where the cannon arm available to your heavy fighter contemporaries normally being low in ammunition capacity. Whereas you have 150 rounds per machine gun in the case of your two 12.7 liters machine guns. But then again, does that really leave much room open to missing targets? Because you can exhaust this ammunition rather quickly and then be forced to rely on your 7.62mm machine gun, which will keep on firing for a short while as you reload the higher caliber machine gun. And it is worth noting that sometimes you can be forced into one of these reloads if you're not accurate or managing your ammunition at an inconvenient point in time. And again, this is offset by the quick reload rate on the caliber of the machine gun where the 12.7mm has a much faster reload than a 20mm cannon, so it trades for a pro and a con. As we come down the Typhoon here, however, we can see the pros of these machine guns going to affect ripping the fire apart for our third kill of the game, and we're keeping an eye on the MiG-3 that's loitering above us right now and suppressing us into a low altitude pocket, if you will. Now, this does work to our advantage in the fact that the ideal altitude range for the P3 early is from ground level up to 3000 metres. If you go above 3,500 meters, you'll find that your control surfaces start to hit their maximum altitude, where at 3,500 meters plus, there's an additional heaviness added to the elevator, which is already heavy, and really makes this plane difficult to fly in terms of getting the nose up, or turns forcing the plane to loop, or even conducting a basic rollover and turn on the elevator. 
As for your engine performance, this is not compromised until you hit 5,500 meters altitude, at which point there is a gradual drop off in acceleration, giving you the comfort factor of being able to climb after enemy bombers and bring them down even at the highest of altitudes for your battery rating when you're the lower battery rating aircraft and seeing bombers at a battery rating of say 2.7 or 3.0, so you do have that ability to pursue up on high. But keep in mind this is with bombers only rather than going after an enemy fighter that can outmaneuver you because once you go higher and higher your elevator becomes compromised to the point that turn fighting becomes non-existent. Arguably then you need to stay low in this aircraft and make the most out of that low altitude performance. And the ideal speed range is something we should now come on to. As one may have guessed, while this plane lacking the overall turn fighting capability, the ideal speed range is going to be towards the higher end of the spectrum and encourage you to keep your pace up in that the ideal speed range is 350 to 500 km an hour, where the control surfaces will be at their maximum performance. I would strongly discourage you from going below 275 km an hour wherever possible, otherwise still characteristics will start to come in. And as we dive down the M1K1 here, we're getting our bombs lined up onto the target, bombs away, and that's going to be their day. Another kill in the bag. And you can see here as we swoop away from the centre of the battlefield, we do have a Hurricane at Mark IV shooting towards us, but putting our nose down a little bit, we continue to maintain our speed, and we pull away from the centre of the map, also seeing an SU-2 taking some pot shots at us, but none are hitting considerably. And in getting away right now, we can see our practice of being an inconvenience to planes on the airfield coming into full effect, as nobody was able to successfully retaliate against our actions, and the damage we have taken to our fuselage is extremely minor, thanks to the highly durable airframe. Now we break away, but one downside to using the bombs is, note the reload timer in the top left of your screen, which started off in the region of just over three and a half minutes. Because this plane is classified as a heavy fighter, the bomb reload or the rocket reload is going to be longer than that of say a ground attack aircraft or a plane that's designated as an attacker or bomber in game. I mean that reloads on your secondary armament will take considerable time and you need to make sure you get the most out of your secondary armament before going for that reload. We can see a Spitfire going after one of our friendlies here at close range. We're getting ready to break away in case they decide to come after us. Spitfire Mark 2 b and we pick them off for our race in a day. And we're continuously keeping in mind the MiG-3 hanging above us, who is trying to use their overall altitude position to come down us in a boom and zoom strike. But what you'll note here actually is that the climb rate of the P-3 early is working to our favour. And the fact that we're being forced to fly so low means we're getting the most out of the engines of this plane. The climb of engines giving us the climb rate capability to build up a bit of altitude Enough, in fact, to then go into a split test or at least cut underneath the MiG-3. Using our altitude there to build up our speed, force the MiG-3 to follow us down, and that will cause their control surfaces to lock up to a non-ideal point where if they want to conduct boom and zoom on us, they're going to get a very limited angle on target. So that's why we're getting the most out of the P-3 early and the MiG-3 is having difficulty in tracking us as such, because now as they come down, we go into the split test, which means we can drop our altitude, we build up our speed, we force them to build up their speed if they want to follow us, and as their control surfaces are locking up here, we make ourselves a different target, and then they break away and get ready to come around perhaps again. But as we go back into our return climb already, we can see how we're pulling a bit of distance as the MiG-3 starts to perhaps come around. And as we're starting to build our altitude, we're getting ready once again to go into that split test and make that defensive maneuver. Of course, over time, we would bleed off our energy to the point the MiG-3 would be in a position to bring us down, but it keeps us alive in the long haul and means that we can loiter around our friendlies, particularly coming from the spawn, to keep us safe and harass the MiG-3 in return. Now, making our way over towards the centre of the map once more, keeping an eye on the MiG-3 at all times, the other items to note with regards to the P-3 early is that the defensive firepower is only really strong, in my experience, if an opponent gets too close, but by the time they get too close, they're normally ripping into the tail section of this aircraft. I mean, you'll be able to trade off this plane with the foe that's bringing you down, or you'll take considerable damage before you're able to bring that foe down. And that foe, I should elaborate, is normally a biplane or an early monoplane such as the P-36A Hawk who got too close to their own desire. If you're going up against higher battery rating aircraft, such as a MiG-334 at 2.7, they'll have the armament to be able to rip you apart at a longer distance thanks to the fact they have 20mm cannon and that means they're able to cut you apart before you can really get your 7.62mm defensive machine gun to work effectively. And I say singular machine gun here because the limitation of the machine gun in the tail section of the plane is that it's a remote control one on a very limited traversal arc and you need your opponent to be flying directly behind the tail of this plane or at least in a relatively straight line behind the tail of the plane for that machine gun to be active. I mean that you're limited to a single machine gun that fires behind the plane and upwards behind the plane and then that tail machine gun will come in in a rare circumstance. But I would argue that the machine guns cannot be relied upon to bring down all foes, just those who lack the overall durability and have got careless in trying to follow you too closely. But be ready to take considerable damage as you use the machine gun in order to defend yourself. 
And again, this machine gun doesn't have the best of ammo capacity. You'll find that the machine gun reloads rather rapidly. And you do have to be careful with the fact that both of these machine guns in the rear can overheat rather early. And in turn, if you're not controlling your machine gun fire through successive bursts, you'll cause the guns to jam before you've even started to do damage to your foe as they're coming in. So all factors to consider in your defensive approach. But really you want to orientate yourself towards the pace of the aircraft and use the defensive machine guns as a warning device in these higher battle rating matchups. And now as we level out we can see that the higher altitude regions that the sky have cleared out and we're starting to make our way towards the Catalina coming in. But are we going to get there in time? What if our bombs haven't just reloaded? We're looking down low, there's nothing to bomb on the airfield and the ground targets are too far away by looks of things to drop our bombs on those. So we're going after the Catalina, will we get there though? The game is practically at its end. Unfortunately not, we're just going to open fire an extended distance as the game concludes. We know we're not able to pick up another kill and we'll have to live off a six for the time being. Still a valiant effort and it'll be shortly time to pop over to the post-game stats. Here we go. This time around, deploying our P3 early as a heavy fighter in a more defensive configuration, only reaching out of our 100kg bombs when targets of opportunity presented themselves on the airfield, we're able to pick up 6 air targets, netting us 14,210 silver lines and 1,786 research points. When facing the P3 early in a one-on-one -on -one engagement, I would recommend one or two approaches to defeating this aircraft. The first is to engage it in the turn fire. Reason being, the P3 early has the widest turn circle of its battery rating compared to its fighter and heavy fighter contemporaries, this issue only being worsened by the plane's inclination to bleed energy in the horizontal, causing its speed to drop outside of its idle speed range of 350 to 500 km an hour and below 275 km an hour, at which point its already heavy elevator only becomes worse and starts to refuse to lift as if the plane is getting ready to stall. This will provide you with ample opportunity to come around on the plane 6 and start to cut it apart. Just be careful of the dorsal 7.62mm Chicasse machine gun, which can cause significant damage to your plane if you get too close. Additionally, be wary of the fact that the plane's pilot may be alert to their plane's lack of turn fighting capability, and will immediately dive towards friendly territory, trying to use the plane's good acceleration in the dive and outright pace to put distance between you and them. This encourages the need for you to try and force the P3 early into a turn fight at lower altitudes, i.e. less than 1000 meters, especially if they've just entered the zoom part of a boom and zoom pass. The alternative option is to bait it into following you in a sharp climb if you find yourself above it in the first instance. Whilst the climb rate of the P3 early is average, its mediocre sustainability means that the plane cannot climb for extended periods of time before heading towards a stall at 140 km an hour. Moreover, the plane's poor elevator control will be triggered quickly in this scenario as the plane will be forced to drop its speed below 275 km an hour in pursuing you. By continually adjusting your flight path as you climb above the P3 early, you can frustrate its pilot's aim and force it into a stall. This will then provide you with a considerable period of time to conduct a hammerhead or a loop if you have sufficient speed available before coming down top of the plane as it tries to recover from stalling. The stall recovery taking an extended period of time as it needs to raise its speed above 250 km an hour to regain control. Planes such as the Heinkel 100D1 and the Ki 45 Co can exploit this approach with relative ease. To wrap up, let us first recap the strengths and weaknesses of the P3 early. Its main strengths are number 1. It is versatile. Whereas its battery rating contemporaries such as the POTUS 631 and the Breda BA88 will feel confined to the heavy fighter role, the P3 early has the flexibility to also be used for ground attack. This due to its ability to mount a variety of bombs or rockets to assist eliminating clusters of ground targets with minimal impact to the plane's performance. Number 2. Outright pace. Able to build up a lot of speed quickly in both a straight line and a dive, the P3 early will prove difficult to catch even for higher battery rated fighters such as the VG33C1 and the F4U1A Corsair. This provides the aircraft with greater freedom to operate, especially below 3000 meters altitude where the plane's performance will be at its best. And number 3, highly durable airframe. With the P3 early's airframe being able to withstand considerable punishment from the machine gun caliber weaponry most of its opponents will be fielding, its pilot does not have to be afraid of taking hits. Moreover, even if one of its fuel tanks is ignited, there is a high chance the fire will burn out before it consumes the aircraft. As for its key weaknesses, number one, restrictive elevator. The elevator of the P3 early is by far its weakest control surface, 
whereby its elevator contributes to the plane having the widest turn circle for a fighter or heavy fighter at its battle rating, a very wide loop circle, stall in mid-loop if the loop is started below 400 km an hour, and a high stall recovery speed of 250 km an hour. Number 2. Subpar Offensive Armament With most of its battle rating contemporaries within the heavy fighter class filling at least one 20mm cannon, the P-3 Elise offensive machine guns can feel subpar in instances where you have a limited time on target. Planning one's attacks with the intention of maximising time on target is crucial to getting the most out of this plane's armament. As for my final opinion of the aircraft, for its battle rating, the P-3 Early offers greater versatility than the other heavy fighters available, being able to switch between heavy fighter and ground attack mid-game. This is a result of the plane's great pace below 3000 meters altitude, and numerous secondary armament options which have minimal impact on the plane's performance. The plane may not be to everyone's liking due to its machine gun orientated offensive armament and heavy elevator, but for those looking for a heavy fighter which gives its pilot options, the PE 3 Early fits the bill nicely. With that, that is all I've got time for today. For my next review in two weeks time, scheduled to go live on Sunday the 18th of November 2018, I intend to review either the Messerschmitt 109 G2 drop the tier 3 battle rating 5.0 German fighter, or the J7W1 Shindam, the tier 4 battle rating 5.7 Japanese interceptor. Which of these two aircraft I review is entirely up to you. You can cast your vote by using the hyperlink in the description of this video. Polling will close at 1200 hours GMT on Sunday the 11th of November 2018. But as always, I've been TX141. If you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. And until next time ladies and gentlemen, take care and good luck in the skies.